Melissa Tickle here. I'm an investment manager for Finca Ventures, which is an early stage impact investor um, that invests mainly across agriculture, financial inclusion, and health. Uh, and we have two of our portfolio companies today, um, Chanzi and Nature Lock, that we'll be uh, presenting. Um, so just to, to give a little bit of context as to why we put together this panel, um, we've seen that many agricultural interventions in emerging markets are really focused on driving increase in, um, in productivity and yields, uh, but at the same time, over 40% of food is uh, wasted in, in East Africa and in India, which we're also talking about today, um, primarily due to lack of post-harvest uh, storage and access to market. Um, food waste is the largest component that's going into landfills, uh, and one-third of all CO2 emissions and methane produced worldwide is organic waste. Uh, these challenges are only going to continue to increase as population grows and food production grows. Um, and the environmental implications and food security implications of this um, is something that we, we felt should be touched upon um, and wanted to bring together a few actors to discuss some of the opportunities and, uh, and challenges that they're seeing in this space. Um, so with that, um, starting from an investor perspective, um, would love, Chris, if you could give us an intro on yourself, uh, talk about Acumen's broader investment thesis as it relates to climate and agriculture, mm. and then more specifically with uh, the topic at hand today. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Welcome, folks. Chris Wayne, uh, Associate Director of Investing in Agriculture uh, at Acumen. Um, Acumen, at its heart, is an anti-poverty organization. Um, we invest philanthropic-backed, early-stage capital, and entrepreneurs solving problems of poverty. Um, and we couldn't meaningfully have a conversation about poverty without focusing on the 600 million uh, smallholder farmers across the globe, um, the majority of them who are living at or below the poverty line. Um, we also recognize that agriculture, um, in terms of economic development, um, has as much as a three times return on impact uh, compared to other sectors when we invest in it. So, um, we've been investing in agriculture on that premise for a long time. Uh, we started our first agriculture investment uh, in 2004 in Pakistan um, in drip tape. Um, and since then have made 35 uh, philanthropic bagged agriculture investments, deploying about $36 million in capital uh, across 11 different countries, primarily focused in East and West Africa, India, Pakistan, and Latin America. Um, We've learned a lot over those 18 years. And I uh, was given the, the grace and, and space. So early. much for having me today in this um, session. Huh. Oh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is a highly interactive session where people will <laughs> cut me off. <laughs> um, yeah, I had, I had space and time to dig into our portfolio when I first got to Acumen, which was really uh, an incredible experience going back 18 years um, and uncovering insights about what we did, where we made mistakes, um, and what, what that could do to inform uh, a forward-looking strategy um, at Acumen. Um, and that year's worth of work now sits at the, the center of our forward-looking strategy and a new initiative called Trellis, um, which will deploy $20 million of investment capital and $2.5 million of technical assistance um, across a four-region investment area over the next five years early stage equity and equity-like capital. Um, there are four business models central to Trellis, and I'll spare you the, the long description of all four uh, for favor of sort of the last one that we talk about most, and that's most relevant to this conversation, which is something we call a value chain optimizer. And this is a business that functions in the middle of the supply chain to create additional efficiencies, in our case, essentially to drive value back up the supply chain to smallholder farmers. Um, there's a lot of ways to sort of solve supply chain issues, but we think food waste uh, is one of the most impactful for smallholder farmers. Um, in emerging economies, especially, uh, access to cold storage um, is a, a huge issue um, and is quite dependent on access to electric grid energy, which is inconsistent. Um, it, my colleague out of our India office uh, describes, on average, about a four-hour window of electricity access for rural uh, households and farmers. Um, 
food waste um, in emerging economies is quite different than developed economies. So uh, here in the United States or across developed economies, we talk about food waste primarily at the end of the supply chain, where in retail and consumer preferences are driving huge losses. But in emerging economies, we're talking about food waste in that middle part of the supply chain, uh, either on farm, directly post-harvest, uh, or in the aggregation and processing and cold storage. So it's no surprise then that Acumen's uh, sort of investment thesis around this business model focuses in on those middle of the supply chain actors. Great, makes rational sense. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. If we go back to our North Star of poverty alleviation, we need to ensure somehow that when we make a middle of the supply chain investment, it's not exclusively enriching middle of the supply chain actors, but that the value created via the food loss reduction is going back up in some capacity to smallholder farmers. Um, and that's nice to talk about. It's harder to do in practice. Um, three of the metrics we look at to try to ensure that this is happening is whether the technology extends beyond the supply chain itself to the farm level. So is the technology actually supporting additional marketable product for the farm? Okay? Are they able to save more product on their farm that becomes marketable and improves their incomes? Um, also, does the, the point of market sale move closer to the farm business? So are we able to move the point of sale and therefore the time of transport of the product from the farm to the point of sale? Are we able to reduce that, make that smaller? therefore limiting the amount of food loss, respiration of fresh fruits and vegetables that could occur on that trip. And thirdly, can we create a secondary market, which we'll see in a video in a second, for some of the product that isn't perfect, that's second, um, that would add additional value to the smallholder farmer's business. So that's sort of the lens we look at. Um, and each time we assess a business model in that space, we, we take that lens, we, we sort of overlay it as a veil across the investment to ensure that yes, the middle of the supply chain actor is being served, but there's legitimate value being created. We work with our lean data partner, 60 decibels, to measure in diligence the impact on the smallholder farmer community to verify and ensure that the investee, who we believe in and is noble, but also um, you know, is, is, is promoting their business, um, but just to verify that what they're telling us is true of the impact on smallholder farmers. I just want to close on something exciting uh, as well at Acumen uh, in the sense that um, we have traditionally, and if there's other impact investors out here, um, had two primary sectors of our investment. We've had many, but two primary in energy and agriculture. And we're seeing a lot more crossover in our energy work and agriculture work, our strategic crossover here. Um, and our agriculture work is really intended to create fundamental systems that service smallholder farmers. Um, and our energy work is now coming into play in the sense that it's supercharging key components of that system in a way that create affordable, accessible, and clean energy for smallholder farmers in this really nice synergy and crossover between our two strategies. And food waste is right, is, is a central metric to that crossover. So, it's an exciting time for food waste and an acumen. Thank you for that. Um, and now, yeah, we're going to transition to having some of our portfolio companies that we mentioned kind of walk through their business model, um, how they're incorporating food waste and, and some of the challenges that they're seeing. And then we'll come back to in, in-person discussion once again. Thanks so much for having me today in this um, session. And I'm Tei Mukunya Owundo. Um, I'm a co-founder of Nature Lock Foods. And what we're doing at Nature Lock is to preserve um, food that would otherwise go to waste by um, converting it into stews. We first cook it, we first pre-cook the foods with ingredients such as legumes and lentils. And, um, and then we load them with vegetables. And once we do that, we, 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 the, it's all about the taste of the product. And then we lock that into place into a stew. And a stew would be that you rehydrate it. Um, the, it's a dry, brittle flake that we pack. It has a, a long shelf life because it's packed in a dry, in a dry manner, and it's uh, it's got um, shelf a long shelf life. And so, what the consumer will do is just um, rehydrate it with hot water, and they're good to go. And they can have they can have their stews cooked uh, together with an accompaniment like rice or um, any other starch that they would have. So, so the, the interesting part of, of um, our business model is that we can be able to preserve 
what what foods that are in the at the farm level and convert that in our in our um, product development space into end products that are consumer friendly. And we have started in Kenya. We believe that we can roll this model out because it's all about the palette. It's all about what is available on ground level at the farmer level. And, and we specifically look out for what would go to waste if we didn't um, collect it for at farm level and put it into our, our dried products. And then stews is where we have began, um, soups and stews. And what will happen is that we do have a, an a, array of um, different ways of uh, recipes that we will put together in the form of um, meats and um, fruits and, and other types of vegetables that can go into the process. And so where we see a lot of impact, especially around vegetables, is um, when there's glut, there's pockets of, of across all African countries, there's those uh, regions that have a lot of produce. And, and then there's those regions that have almost nothing and they're arid or semi-arid in some cases. And so how do we get this food that is plenty in some seasons when it's, there's rainfall and how do we preserve that food that then have it go to the communities that don't have access to these um, fruits and vegetables and legumes. And at the same time, we're working with um, different partners to be able to come up with solutions that would also enhance fortification. Right now in the country, we're having a lot of um, uh, drought and um, uh, a lot of climate action that's that's not working. Uh, that, that is a crisis in the country. And so how do we engage feeding programs? How do we feed the children in schools? How do we look at the vulnerable communities and provide to them what our solution um, entails? And so we also are a nutrition solution for, for these kinds of vulnerable groups. So I'll stop there for now, but uh, we feel that this model can be scaled up significantly across Africa. So where, where then we can feed ourselves with our own food from our own soils, that makes sense. Thank you so much, Tay. Uh, and Andrew, over to you. Uh, can you also give an introduction of yourself and Chenzi and then dive a little bit more into the business model? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Wallace, co-founder and CEO of Chanzi. Um, Chanzi is an insect protein company in East Africa. And what we do is we, we grow maggots. Um, we solve three of the biggest issues facing humanity in the 21st century. We take food waste, which is a huge problem. Um, and we convert that food waste into protein for animal feed using a, uh, larvae called the black soldier fly larvae. Um, in doing so, we obviously prof profitably upcycle it into a valuable commodity um, and a commodity that alternatives are having uh, rather environmentally ruinous effects on our rivers, seas and uh, oceans. Um, that is what we do. Uh, and then over to you, Nidhi, from uh, SRAS. Can you give a brief introduction and then uh, dive into the business model, please? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, at S4S, we are reducing the food wastage that uh, the at the farm gate. Uh, for the smallholder farmers, whatever is the lower grade produce, which would either not get the right price in the market or would get wasted, we help them process this produce and convert them into food ingredients. So we provide them end-to-end entire ecosystem that is required for them to process these produce uh, to food ingredients. So starting from technology, access to finance, market linkage, raw material training, everything is provided to smallholder farmers to convert the produce at the farm gate itself, aggregate this produce, uh, do quality control and supply these as food ingredients to food and beverage industry. Uh, in India, the challenge is huge. We waste food worth $14 billion. And the, the problem of food wastage is either is because of lack of infrastructure at the farm gate, not feasible, having the feasibility to uh, preserve the food using cold storage because of lack of electricity uh, and also challenges of smallholder farmers to reach distant markets. So we help them process this produce using solar powered food dehydrators that we 
give give to these farmers we are working with 60000 small holder farmers and 1200 women micro entrepreneurs who process the produce great thank you and maybe uh, just starting with you um how are you measuring the environmental impact of the business model and the work that you do uh, there are three ways in which we measure our environmental impact first is what is the food that we prevent from getting wasted so what is our processing capacity is what we are preventing from the food from getting wasted uh, these food products are uh, are highly perishable so onion ginger garlic turmeric all these uh, products so we uh, we prevent 60000 tons of food from getting wasted so that is the first thing that we measure second is we use solar powered uh, uh technology to prevent uh, to process this produce so our second level of environmental impact that we measure is the energies uh, that we are the co2 that we are saving from entering the environment uh, by switching it from a traditional method like using coal or electricity to process switching this to solar powered so how much co2 or electricity is what we are uh, preventing from getting used and the third part of our uh, solution that we measure is what is the minimum uh, is the re- reduced logistics that we have in our business model so instead of uh, transporting fresh produce and the current supply chain moving from a uh, farmer to uh, the market to the processor we uh, no longer have to transport the fresh produce uh, so instead of transporting 10 vehicles of onion we now only have to transport one vehicle so that minimum logistics that uh, minimum movement of logistics is what we are measuring the this is more on climate mitigation on climate adaptation what we see is that we are helping farmers become more climate resilient so in whenever there is a shock climate shock the farmers have an alternate so way of uh, using their produce so they can process it also there is a change in their cropping pattern as more and more market linkages available uh, they they know that for perishable produce they have a, a short market at the village level they now switch from their more cash crops to more climate resilient uh, crops and their varieties so they switch to horticulture where they don't have they don't perceive uh, the same amount of climate risk so this is the way we are measuring our climate impact and all of this is done using our digital infrastructure we have uh, end to end digitization Uh, in our um, in our organization and at each stage of our operations we uh, measure this andrew back to you um would you be able to talk through uh how exactly you're you're measuring the environmental impact uh, kind of along the value chain yeah so f- for every chanzi facility we take at least 18 metric tons of organic waste every day and profitably upcycle that into sustainable protein for animal feed um what a lot of people don't understand about organic waste is when it breaks down in landfill um it releases methane gas and nitrous oxide both of which are pretty uh, ruinous for our our environment in fact 10% of all global greenhouse gas emissions comes from the food that we throw in the bin so by converting that into protein instead of methane we've obviously got a huge um carbon offset um from what we're doing um there's a lot of other environmental benefits to what we're doing we're selling a, a sustainably sourced protein what people tend to use in our part of the world is fish meal uh, when you consider that the vast majority of global fish stocks are threatened or or, or critically endangered um it's great news that we can provide a protein source that is cheaper more sustainable and better quality um but in truth i always get a bit suspicious when people hark on about the environmental impact of their business uh, people that know anything about insect protein will know that it is truly circular um and it is the very essence of a sustainable business so really how we how we measure our impact is we um just track our production the more we produce the bigger environmental impact we have um and that's a fantastic business to be in. 
Um, maybe jumping back to uh, Nidhi, um, it would be great if you could provide some more uh, examples of the types of organizations or farmers that, uh, that you're sourcing from um, and the opportunity that this brings to the smallholder farmer. Sure. Uh, so we source 100% from smallholder farmers who earn less than three and a half dollars per day. Uh, we source from 60,000 uh, farmers. They are in our network who have access to market. The farmers who process the produce are 100% women farmers. Uh, they are our, we help them take the journey from farmers to uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, these are women are all new to credit. They uh, they were either landless or working as farm laborer. They have sporadic work opportunities. They cannot travel outside their home. They live in poverty. They, as men migrate to cities in search of alternate income options, women are required to run the household and also work at the farm. So for these women uh, farmers, this is an alternate source of li livelihood. So creating an entire end-to-end uh, -end thing for them so that they can process where they are, uh, staying at their farm or staying at their home. Uh, we create small farm factories, farm, uh, farm factories for them and aggregate these produ uh, the processed produce that they make and supply to food and beverage industry. These would be like of your Sodex, so Nestle, Capital Foods. Uh, these are our food and beverage cu customers and also small hotel restaurant catering industries like Indian Railways or uh, Cloud Kitchen. So uh, we have two types of uh, customers. One is definitely the smallholder farmers and women of micro entrepreneurs who process, uh, who, uh, who from whom we procure and process, and other is to whom we supply, which is the large food and beverage industry. A hundred percent of our uh, value chain, which is our micro entrepreneur partners, are in poverty, and we help them double down their household income and move, help them move out of poverty. So they earn a uh, thousand to fifteen hundred dollars as an annual additional income, and we save sixty thousand tons of produce from getting wasted and three hundred thousand tons of CO two annually from entering the environment. So this is a win win situation for all. Maybe switching over to uh, to sourcing, um, can you provide some examples of the types of organizations that you're sourcing ingredients from? Um, specifically those that are sourcing food loss and the impact and opportunity that this provides to a smallholder farmer in Kenya. Oh yeah, uh, we're sourcing um, predominantly uh, vegetables from Farm to Feed. Farm to Feed is an organization that um, as we were setting off, we, we connected and partnered uh, immediately because we felt that we were complementing each other. And what they do is is look for food in, in the environs around Nairobi where they, they will collect what would go to waste. So for example, they have farmer communities and in those communities, they have a, a central place where once the farmers have sold what they, they can in the marketplace, then whatever is left over and, and it's definitely good, then they consolidate it and farm to feed will distribute it to their supplier base. So we have become a, a subscriber to these these foods, and these are wonky carrots. These are tomatoes that maybe um, are not the shape that the market desires. And we take these and we process them into our products, and we have we are able then to reduce on that waste. Um, the other portion of waste that we feel we or, or it might not be waste in particular, but it, it does contribute to climate um, uh, resilience is sourcing through the Ministry of Agriculture the varieties of the mung beans or um, the beans that are resilient and can grow in the semi-arid areas where, it's, where only these varieties can grow. So when what we are doing is, is creating farmer, a farmer base where we can stimulate them to grow these crops and then we can offtake commercially and then the communities then can have um, a business uh, model for them that will grow them. And at the same time, they can grow food that they can eat um, themselves. And then in the long term, we see 
ourselves being able to bring this um, model to the community level because our, our process is simple enough that it can be tailored to an off-grid space, um, an off-grid place in the community level where then the transporting of the um, raw ingredients does not have to, to happen and we can bring the process to the farm level. And so we can process what is what is going to waste. So this takes care of the sensitive like vegetables or fruits that would then go to waste and cannot be transported because of the remoteness of the regions. Again, being able to assist the farmers in that way. So long-term we see ourselves going into that space as well and being a solution on the ground at farm level. Great. So. Uh, we've seen a couple of great examples of, of uh, portfolio companies um, that are working in this food waste space. And just wondering if you could uh, touch on some additional business models that you've seen, whether sure. in portfolio pipeline uh, that you're excited about. Sure. Um, yeah, I think I think um, just a, a big shout out to Needy there, uh, who's an Acumen investee. Um, her model specifically of sort of expanding the number of access point nodes into local communities is a uh, is a is a is a capital extens extensive uh, capital uh, expensive model but is is um, is starting to become a theme across our portfolio and the, the other example of that that we have most recently is a company called Promethean uh, out of India that uh, we invested in three years ago um, at a time when they designed and manufactured a bulk milk chiller specifically for the dairy industry mm -hmm. Um, and the primary market was, uh, it was a B2B model where they were selling to sort of large but fragmented, uh, dairy aggregators, um, across India, um, and had real impact and scale potential. And we were uh, excited about it. Um, they came back to us this year, um, and said, we want to take that model, um, and add a micro chiller, uh, to that. And this is, a the difference between a 2,000 liter bulk milk chiller down to a 40 to 60 liter micro chiller, um, which has six individual tanks, uh, each at 10 to 15 uh, liters individually. And what we want to do is we want to extend that down to the village level. So we want, similar to Needy's model, to have a village level entrepreneur manage that asset. We want to source directly from smallholder farmers, aggregate in these nodes, and then create centralized aggregation facilities going forward. Um, and then they went further and said, we want to make those village level entrepreneurs village level centers, where they'll also offer a bundled suite of services, including inputs, primarily feed, um, extension services, on the farm extension services, and through digital applications to support animal health, and veterinary services specifically um, to improve animal health and milk production and milk quality on the farm. Um, and you can see it, and it's true of, of a lot of emerging market models, um, where the vertical integration, the necess necessity to bundle services together to fill multiple gaps across them is real. So um, we're really excited about that transition for Promethean. We think it's going to be a, um, uh, an important sort of shift of their business model, which will deepen and increase impact for smallholder farmer communities that we're focused on. Um, the, other is a, uh, the other one I wanted to bring up is a, an East African pipeline company um, that's created a lipid-based um, coating for vegetables and fruits um, that can be applied directly after harvest um, that uh, has the capacity to maintain quality and improve shelf life of products by, by up to 10 times um, its original value outside of cold chain storage necessity. So um, if this works, um, at least in adjacent to cold storage, if not a partial replacement of some of the cold storage needs around the world. So um, it's those type of innovative models um, that Acumen, with its relatively small amount of capital, is really trying to uplift, invest in, um, and drive the rest of the impact investing community to focus in on. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, we are going to hear a, a different perspective from uh, Carolina Garcia, who is part of ABM Bev's 100 Plus Accelerator Program, um, and she'll give much more of an explanation here, but basically discussing how, as a large corporate, they're working with startups to solve many of the environmental challenges they have kind of along the value chain, but specifically post-production here.
in a couple seconds. I'm Carolina Garcia, <laughs> I'm the Global Sustainability and Innovation Director for AB InBev, and I work for a, an amazing initiative that's called the 100 Plus Accelerator, an initiative that AB InBev launched back in 2018 to partner with startups all across the world that were solving sustainability challenges and that could help us close our, our gaps. So basically, every year we publish a list of challenges that we're facing to reach our global sustainability goals. We select startups. We give them each up to $100,000 to test and prove their solution within our value chain. And after that, we help them grow and scale. Uh, however, uh, two years ago already, uh, other amazing partners joined the initiative. And now the 100 Plus Accelerator is led by AB InBev, Colgate, Palmolive, Coca-Cola, and Unilever, Unilever. And the four companies are working together to boost innovation through collaboration. Um, and based off of those challenges and, and call for proposals that the accelerator puts out every year, could you kind of walk through what some of the operational challenges are for AB and Bev, um, and then what the goal is with the accelerator program and the companies that come through that? Of course, every year we have a different challenges. You can find all of them in our webpage, and I invite you all to follow us in our webpage and in our social media, and you'll get to see the progress that we're doing and all the great partnerships that we're doing with startups. But more or less, we have a, a big piece on circular economy that focuses primarily on circular packaging and how can we make all of our packaging not only uh, be made out of sustainable materials, but also be reused and recycled. We also have a big part of upcycling our waste, and this is how we ended up partnering with Chansey also here in the panel. Uh, because they help us upcycle our organic waste produced uh, in our breweries. And actually, this pilot, we also did it in partnership with Unilever. So they're helping us upcycle the organic waste to feed Black Soldier Fly, which is amazing, and I'll tell you more in detail later on. We have challenges around water stewardship, so how can we protect our watershed but also become more water efficient, uh, smart agriculture, how we can transition faster to regenerative agriculture, a climate action, which goes all the way from how to do fuel switch, uh, reduce our emissions throughout our value chain, innovate with different cooling alternatives. Uh, and this year we have other two categories which are very exciting for us. One on biodiversity and the other one on inclusive growth. So every year we will update this very thorough list with all of our subject matter experts and we try to source every year uh, different solutions that are helping us um, reach uh, these gaps. That's great, thank you. And how do you look to work with these companies post the acceleration uh, program? Well, so I, as I was mentioning, the acceleration process uh, from our program, it's super focused on delivering a successful pilot. So once we select the startups, we match them with a local team and together they define the KPIs um, and what they intend to do for the pilot program and uh, Andrew can tell more about the experience with Chansey, but in his case, for example, the pilot was about building a facility in Dar es Salaam, very close to our brewery, uh, and start uh, taking some of our spent yeast and spent grain and proving that actually this startup can actually upcycle our waste. And similar to that case, we do this with all the startups all across the world. Uh, so the pilot usually runs for eight months or so. And in parallel, we also offer training and many other opportunities for the startups. And the idea is that once it's done, if successful, we help them grow and scale to other countries or inside the same country or to another zone. Um, so in the case of Chansey, which I'm putting it as an example because it's here on the panel, so it's easy for me. Um, we are now looking forward to scale this solution in partnership with Unilever as well to Kenya and South Africa and to other sites in Tanzania as well. So we, once we prove that that solution is feasible, it's doable, it's cost effective, it's helping us drive sustainability, we try to make a plan to help these solutions grow and scale. And what we have seen is that more than 50% of the startups that go through the program end up working with us in the long run and are scaled and they grow with us. Thank you for that. Uh, and then maybe shifting over to Andrew, because we do have him on the panel. Um, you're just coming out of this program um, with funding in addition to a partner for scale. So it would be 
great uh, if there's any additional context you wanted to add about the partnership that Carolina missed. Um, and then also, um, if you have any advice for local organizations that are also looking to partner with a large corporate, um, that would be great for the audience. Yeah, interesting question, how to work with a multinational big corporation. <laughs> um, I used to work for one. And from experience, I can tell there's often a huge disconnect between what's being said at the top and what's actually being done on the ground because it's such a large behemoth. My, my secret is to find a winner, um, find a champion, find someone in that organization that actually cares. And we've heard from Carolina, she's a great example of someone that is actually doing what she's supposed to be doing at a multinational. Um, and through people like Carolina, they do exist at multinationals, I promise, um, you can actually get things done. And so we have, we've grabbed the opportunity with both hands, formed a great relationship. And, and um, yeah, we've, we've been a huge success with our, uh, with, with our pilot. And obviously moving forwards, we've shown the pilot works and it doesn't need to stop there. We can continue expanding. We are providing a waste management solution for AB InBev and Unilever, both of whom produce a lot of waste in their process. Um, we are taking that waste and diverting it from landfill and converting it into something of value, um, which is win-win for everyone involved. Maybe wrapping up, because we, we are towards the end of this panel, just want to give um, some space for any of the panelists to jump in um, if you have any closing remarks or any advice that you would give to entrepreneurs uh, in this sector who are actively fundraising, as I know a few of you are, um, or funders that are seeking to invest in these types of, uh, of solutions? So my, my biggest advice would be that no one organization can solve the world's challenges on its own, and we need to partner all together, this innovation ecosystem, because it is together that we will be able to deliver successful results. So for startups all across the world, like the 100 plus accelerator is one platform. Uh, there are many, of course, and, and look out for the others. But in our case, we're very welcome to, to have you join us in our family. Please follow us. Please apply on the next round of applications. Please reach out because we're looking for these innovators. And for the VCs and the investors, of course, startups cannot grow and deliver to big corporations like, like ourselves without your support, right, to scale. So we all need to partner and work together. For these startups that are innovating to build, to building a better world, you're going to be the companies of the future. I have no doubt about it. So count on us to help you grow and scale in this purpose. Andrew or Nidhi, anything to add? That uh, partner with the right set of investor. Uh, in our case, it was Acumen Fund. And sometimes uh, those investors can add a lot more value to you ap apart from the funding and the money. So look at the right uh, fitment for your organization as an investor and also what all other things that they can do as a value addition, which is industry insights, uh, giving you platforms uh, like these. So uh, definitely look, look at uh, what are the other value add things that the investors would, would bring into the game. Thank you. Andrew? My advice would be to entrepreneurs who are going through a capital raise or about to embark on a capital raise. Um, not all money is the same. Not all investors are the same. In fact, an investor is a little bit like a marriage. Um, once you've got them on board, uh, very difficult to get rid of them. So put a lot of thought into who you are bringing into that bed. Um, because it can really make or break your business. And um, yeah, don't be in a rush to raise money from anyone and everyone. Um, think about what else they're bringing to the table and do you want them in that marriage? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd say, I'd, I'd tell um, entrepreneurs to, to really um, focus on seeing where their solution lies. So sometimes when we're fundraising and out of, out of my experiences, if you focus on the the funds you need more than what your solution is then you might keep adapting your solution to what the the funders require rather than what solution you're bringing that needs funding so it will it is good to to really think through what the solution you have is and um and 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 believe in it so that it is a solution that people believe because you believe 
and they want to support what you believe in, that is much easier to fund, even, even I think from a funder perspective. And it is more sustainable because then you have holding power, you have resilience. You can be able to dig in when it gets hard because you really believe in what you're doing. So that's, that's really a, a very important ingredient. Time check. Four minutes. <laughs> Do you have anything you wanted to it's add? It's hard there? for me to add much more than that advice. And I, I um, from their perspective, um, I think they're best place to make advice like that. I, I would only add um, that entrepreneurs should should try their best to consider scale um, right from the very beginning. It's a much harder thing to add in later on, but if you can bake it in from the start. And Acumen is thinking about scale beyond just um, top line revenue growth. We're thinking about scale of impact as well. So if you can build scale of impact or scale of, of revenue and growth into your business model early um, and figure out the ways you can measure that effectively and report it out, um, the long friendly marriage relationships with impact investors like Acumen are real and on the table um, and exciting. So that would be the only thing I'd close with. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have a couple minutes left for questions. Um, if there's anyone that has one, we have some mics we can pass around. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the insightful and valuable um, conversation. My name is Rami Jada. I'm the CEO of Fototech, and we're building a CapEx light business model to upcycle any type of vegetable size stream on site into, in this case, edible mushrooms to extract protein ingredients. My question mm -hmm. is, in the type of impact investment, is it more like uh, appealable or, or likable a business model in which we try to reduce the funds required for capex, or is yeah? It's a great question. Um, Asset-heavy businesses are are you know difficult to fund, I would say, um, but they're not at all outside of our acumen portfolio. Um, especially when we find when you can make that asset um, part of the wealth generation of the smallholder farmer community, mm -hmm. we're going to look at that quite favorably in our assessment that way. Um, we have some exciting models happening um, in community-based investments around the world where middle of the supply chain asset ownership is being passed directly to communities and farmer communities, often through farmer producer organizations. Um, and in that case, we're excited and um, looking forward to investing in that sort of CapEx heavy asset that way. So um, it depends, of course, on the model, um, but I don't think you should struggle if it's a core part of your model to reduce CapEx in the name of what your larger business is, um, at least from our perspective. I don't know. About yeah, yeah, I would agree. I would say that there's enough, and we similarly invest in different solutions, some that are more CapEx heavy than others. Um, I would say that there's definitely enough funders out there where um, you just you need to know who to approach, but um, the, the capital side. Hi, my question is specifically about Nature Lock. So my understanding is that they're able to preserve the foods, but without any use of actual preservatives. Can you explain a, a little bit more about that patent pending mechanism? Sure. Um, so they basically have designed a way to preserve fruits, vegetables, meat, fish, but focusing on vegetables right now, using natural fiber. Um, so right now they're using cassava flour. Um, and basically uh, they process the or chop up the vegetables to a, a certain size and then are able to implement the, the preservation um, the uniqueness is that it preserves, uh, well, it's significantly less cost uh, intensive as um, some other preservation mechanisms, and it uh, keeps the same flavor profile, nutritional profile, and color profile as well um, of the product. Um, so they're starting with this product called Stew's Day that they launched uh, in Nairobi and in Kenya, um, and then are looking to use this technology across a variety of different types of products, even in um, like Flavor, fruit flavorings for um, like ice cream and things that are a little bit more upmarket. Um, they see a huge demand for a more cost-effective way to, to get access to that flavor. 